There was a wide variety of clothing available on the colonial frontier. As the generations gradually moved westward along the Allegheny, Smoky, and Blue Ridge Mountains, there evolved a pleasant and practical blend of European fashion and Native American dress. George Morgan, who was an English trader in the late 1760s along the lower Ohio Valley, working mainly out of Kaskia, Illinois, George Morgan had for sale in his uh, trading stores a wide variety of fabrics, including Irish linen, uh, Osenberg, Ticklenburg, fabrics that were a blend of linen and wool, linen and cotton. He had a, a wide variety of patterns and colors too, including some that had green backgrounds and seven color patterns. However, the, the lower working class, especially those who became uh, woodsmen and long hunters, they tended to buy things that were more practical. And one of the more common uh, types of fabrics that they bought uh, were the uh, check pattern. Loose fitting, uh, fairly long. If a man wore breeches with them, the shirts tended to be shorter. If he wanted to sleep in them, they would be longer. And if they wanted to wear them uh, in the woods to protect their legs, they'd even be longer. This one is uh, basically made out of the same material as the one I'm wearing now. As you can see, mine comes down to the knees. It doesn't have a finished hem at the bottom, it's just, so it's just it's fraying out naturally. I kind of like that look. But these shirts uh, would have gussets in the bottoms of the sleeves for freedom of movement, big squares. This one even had the uh, hem ripped along the back of the collar, just to give it a little fringe effect. There are plenty of varieties and variations to even the, the basic shirt pattern, the style of clothing. It, it, they just didn't wear one type of shirt, although they're typical patterns that they use. These uh, shirts that I've been showing you are, are very plain, very functional, very practical, but they are not the one shirt that has become the signature hallmark uh, item of the frontier. And that is typically then called the rifleman's frock or the rifleman's shirt, the wraparound uh, hunting shirt with the fringe cape and the layers of fringe. The jury's still out, and there's still a lot of debate amongst historians, both living historians and academic historians, exactly when this wraparound, fringed, rifleman shirt came about, when it was popular, when it first was introduced along the frontier. And we do know that when George Washington requested that these rifleman or hunting shirts, as he was calling them, were being made at the beginning of the Revolution, he had to send a pattern or one as a sample to Connecticut so that the people of Connecticut would know what he meant when he requested these shirts to be made. And he ordered 2,000 of them at once. We do know that Daniel Morgan, the famous rifleman of the American Revolution, was often seen in a wraparound hunting shirt, rifleman shirt like this. Nicholas Criswell was wearing something like this in 1775 when he went down the Ohio River. He said that all the men uh, in his party were wearing uh, an item similar to this. In fact, when he went down the Ohio to up the Kentucky River into Harrisburg, and then came back. When he was done with his Kentucky excursion, he hired on with an Indian trader that was heading out into the northern Ohio country. Now this Indian trader said, you have to get out of your hunting shirt because the Indians considered it a great affront for any white man to walk into their territory wearing such a garment. Nicholas Criswell doesn't describe it in his diary. George Morgan, as early as 1767, was selling Ticklebergs at one pound, two shillings, sixpence, for his hunters to make a hunting frock or have one made. He sometimes calls it in his ledgers a frock, sometimes he calls it a hunting frock. He doesn't describe it, doesn't say what it is exactly, except that it cost one pound, two shillings, sixpence for the material thread and the making of it. When Nicholas Criswell uh, journeyed down the Ohio River in 1775 on his way to Harrodsburg, he mentioned that in their two dugouts, Charming Polly and Charming Sally, that they had nine men and seven dogs and all their equipment stuffed in these two dugout canoes. Of the nine men, two of them were wearing breeches, the two Englishmen. And these were what we call typically knee breeches, but they come to the waist and come down just below the knee, and they gather tightly around the knee with like these have a series of pewter buttons, but they tend to be loose and baggy up at the top. And in the middle of the waistband at the back, knee breeches also had a gusset that could be adjusted. Knee breeches in the front uh, sometimes had pockets, sometimes did not. This style right here, called a drop front, has a panel in the front, drops down. But they were very tight fitting around the knees 
and they got bigger and they got to the top to allow for your freedom of movement. The breech clout that Joseph Doddridge remembers from his childhood days along the colonial frontier, that is in the western parts of Virginia and Pennsylvania in the 1760s, he remembers that breech clout being about nine or ten inches wide and about three foot long. Now a breech clout was held up by putting a leather thong at the waist. Some guys could even use uh, silk scarves to cut down on the chaffing along the hips perhaps, or a little bit uh, wider uh, leather thong. But the breech clout was tucked up underneath the leather thong and allowed to drape down. Then it was brought up underneath and tucked up and over the thong at the back. To protect the lower leg and then the lower part of the thighs, the typical woodland style Native American legging was used. These two leggings here comprise a pair, and they are sewn up the sides, and it's a side seam pattern. That was by far the most common pattern of the woodland uh, tribes. And it would come, some sources say, one hand's width above the knee. Some say longer, some say shorter. It's been my experience, though, that if you're wearing breeches, you can get by with the shorter leg, and if you're going in a breech clout, then the higher, at least up to mid-thigh, is much more practical to protect your legs from the briars and the thorns and the other sharp things you find on the trail. Now, if you're wearing knee breeches, a lot of times guys will cut out a little slit right here and they'll hook it over, they'll sew an additional button to the side of the knee breeches and they'll slide the leggings up and they'll hook, they'll hook the legging on to that button or they will uh, run up and wear another thong around the waist over the breeches and then wear, run a leather thong up here and tie them on. Or some will just uh, hook them on to a button that already exists on the knee breeches. But if you want to wear a leg in a little bit higher, you can sew that extra button on your breeches and bring up your legs a little farther. But you need, they need some connection up here to keep the leg from falling down. And then they are typically gathered under the knee with a variety of types of garters. In fact, Simon Gurdy once bought a quart of rum to trade for a set of Indian garters from a local Indian living there in Kakaskia. Leggings could be made out of uh, brain tan deer skin as these are. They could be made out of wool. Uh, even some made out of linen in the summer. Each one of them has their own advantages and disadvantages. Of course, linen would be very cool in the summertime, but it would not offer very much protection. They would be good for around the settlements or uh, good short scouts out into the woods and you want to protect your stockings and your breeches. I prefer to wear uh, brain tan deer skin leggings year round because I find that they're very cool in the summer. Uh, they're pretty warm in the winter. Uh, they, when they get wet, they can get cold, of course, because they are leather. But I like the leather leggings because they protect my legs from the thorns and the briars and the, all sorts of sticky things you see in the woods.